Hello and welcome, dear viewers, to Cases. I'm your host, Farah Hathwe. Sponsorship system known as Kafala system has been described by human rights organizations as modern day slavery due to tremendous number of complaints resulting from such arrangement. The Gulf Cooperation Council, GCC, includes the six countries of the Persian Peninsula. Bahrain, Kuwait, Amman, Qatar, Saudi Arabia and United Arab Emirates are majorly allowing the use of such method that requires foreigners to have local citizen sponsors known as kafil. Now, the kafil grants permission for foreigners to enter the country, monitors their stay and approves their, approves their exit. But since the kafil is responsible for all these aspects, then a migrant worker's salary, passport, legal documents, living accommodations, meals, ability to work elsewhere, and even their ability to return home are at their mercy of their employer. And once the kafil withdraws sponsorship, the foreigner has no legal right to stay in the country. The International Labour Organization had called for major reforms of the sponsorship system, which has been criticized by many international human rights groups as bonded labor, a system that fosters conditions for exploitation and abuse of migrant workers in the workplace and deprives them of their basic human right to freedom of movement. But no GCC country had shown a minor reform which paved the way for more abuse and more suffering of these expatriate workers. This will be the case discussed in today's episode in our studio with Mr. Mohammed Klait, a social and human rights activist, and through Skype with Mr. Nicholas McGehan, the UAE researcher at Human Rights Watch. Hello and welcome, gentlemen, to Cases. An abbreviation of today's topic, and we will be right back. The sponsorship system, or the so-called kafala system, implemented in the Gulf Cooperation Council countries, aims at controlling the relationship between the sponsor and the migrant worker. Sponsors who have to be citizens of the migrant worker's destination country usually take employees' passports the moment they enter the country, and sometimes add to their possessions the travel documents to extort a large fee before the workers can leave the country. In this sense, the migrant worker remains legally bound to the sponsor's mercy during the contract period. In this regard, in 2011, Human Rights Watch noted the sponsorship system as the modern-day slavery because of the exploitation of migrant workers by their sponsors under the guise of protection. Why is there much focus on Gulf Cooperation Council countries? Interestingly, the majority of GCC countries encompass more migrant population than native, 87 of the population in Qatar are foreigners, 70% in Saudi Arabia, 69% in the United Arab Emirates, and 54% in Bahrain. In this regard, the International Labour Organization estimates 15 million migrant laborers in Gulf countries. One of the recent slavery cases is that of Zahir Belounis, an Algerian footballer who went on a hunger strike after not being paid for two years by his Qatari sponsor. Modern-day slavery explicitly violates the international law, particularly Article 13 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which provides the right to freedom of movement and the right to return to one's country. Moreover, Article 4 of the Forced Labor Convention says, The competent authority shall not impose or permit the imposition of forced or compulsory labor for the benefit of private individuals, companies or associations. How many Zahir Belounis would go on hunger strikes to achieve justice in GCC countries? Where is the responsibility of human rights organizations and the United Nations? When will GCC countries treat migrant workers as human beings? When would this modern-day slavery end in GCC countries? Did the governments of Bahrain and Kuwait really abolish kafala system or just camouflage and ease it? Okay, Mohammed. obviously the report gave a brief explanation of the kafala system. If you can add to that your own personal information, what do we mean by a sponsorship system? What even, I repeat, a kafala system? Why was it created at the beginning in the first place? Well, at, the f at first, if we could like, uh, in, the, in most Gulf countries' uh, laws, the yeah. kafala system is uh, sponsored also by the, by the laws of each of the Gulf countries, as mm -hmm. well as the kafil, which is 
uh, would be a, a private institute or a person by himself, a businessman or so. Mm -hmm. uh, migrant workers come to these Gulf countries by the kafil, which as soon as they land in the Gulf country, he takes their passports and he... Well, much. Uh, but he one takes actually control here can actually ask why would why would there be even kafil? Why would there be even a, a person who would be handling responsibility of other person? Why can't these foreigners come just to uh, these GCC countries and work normally? Why would they need a kafil at their well, first place? Well, in accordance uh, to the GCC, it's uh, it's just to monitor and to organize mm. the migrant workers or the foreign foreign migrant workers in the uh, GCC countries since there's as we as the statistics have shown there's a huge number of migrant workers in GCC countries especially in Qatar which is mostly uh, mostly 49% uh, of migrant workers in Qatar are from Philippines Indonesia and so mm -hmm. and the rest are from Arab countries you have around 70% of the entire Qatari population is made of migrant workers mm -hmm. and not original Qatari citizens. So it's citizens. even more than the number of nationals. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So that, that makes a huge problem also for GCC countries. So they have to organize this. Okay, the kafil, uh, the kafil uh, notion is not the proper notion to control such, uh, such an issue. Yes. It's, it's actually it's, uh, legitimate to do humanitarian, uh, especially because as, as I said, as soon as the migrant worker lands in a GCC country, his passport is cons confiscated by the employer mm -hmm. or the company that he works for. At the same time, uh, he is monitored. The, employ the employee is monitored as every move, where he goes, where he, who he hang out, hangs out with, mm -hmm. where he eats, even if he wants to leave the country or even to change the job. Now, Bahrain is the only country in 2009 that has kind of amended that. Yes. In due to like international pressure, due to international if we can pressure. say. Exactly. Qatar also is, uh, is being stalked by international pressure mm -hmm. for this due to the FIFA. Okay. Uh, since Qatar has won uh, hosting the World Cup in 2022. Yes. But it's still, uh, there are still problems tackling Qatar because of the kafil uh, notion. Mm -hmm. In Bahrain in 2009, it was amended. Now, the Ministry of Labor handles this issue, but at the same time, when an employee, a migrant worker, comes to Bahrain, he still has to work for a private institute, not mm -hmm. for a government institute. Government institutes is only for Bahrainis. Mm -hmm. Thus, it's kind of like just a big umbrella. Yes. The government is just a big umbrella. The, the Labor Ministry, uh, Ministry of Labor is just a big umbrella for the kafil uh, issue because it's still going on in Bahrain. Mm -hmm. Of course. Um, a question goes here for Mr. Uh, Nicholas joining us from London. Uh, Mr. Nicola, out of, of all the Middle Eastern countries, why the Persian Gulf countries specifically, the GCC, are the ones that went in favor of the kafil or even adopted the, 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 the kafala system uh, to that extent? Uh, why are they in need, that much in need of the kafala system in light of other Arab countries or neighboring countries? Yeah, I mean, you have to go back a little bit to the origins of the, the kafala system. Um, it originates from when the Gulf states began to bring migrant labor in mm -hmm. to their countries. And the purpose of the kafala system was to make the sponsor responsible uh, for effectively for the behavior of the guest worker. Uh, it was a way of subordinating, you could say, the responsibility of the state and, and placing the responsibility on the, the employer. Yes. Now, unfortunately, it's become, um, it's become used as a vehicle for exploitation over the years. Mm -hmm. um, to, to return to, to the original question, you know, why the Gulf states? Well, it, really, it's down to the demographics of those states. Um, when you have 85% of the countries as non-nationals, mm -hmm. uh, then the national populations, uh, understandably to an extent, are wary of, of the power uh, that that constituency could have in the country, and they want a means of controlling uh, this enormous workforce. Mm -hmm. Now, unfortunately, they've chosen to do that via this kafala system, uh, and that's responsible. It's only it's only one element 
of the, the very exploitative labor systems in the Gulf states. It's important to... So we can actually say that the aim behind the kafala system or the sponsorship system from the beginning was a brightful idea and a brightful aim in order to control the market, and control the system. That's the initial, initial, the initial impression that one can have towards kafala it's system, that it was, it was created at the beginning in order to like ease in the way for markets and the economic and the way that industries will be functioning. It was a way of making uh, nationals responsible for the behavior of their non-national employers. Okay. It's, since be, it's since become a mechanism of control. Okay. Um, according to what laws and regulations, from your perspective, Mr. Muhammad, um, was the kafala system made? According to what laws, what regulations did they write the kafala system or the sponsorship system? I think it was system? mostly because uh, GCC countries go by the Islamic Sharia, or what mm. they call the ex Islamic Sharia. But at the same time, since you have privatized institutes and as well as foreign or multinational companies working in GCC countries, the Islamic Sharia would be amended in order to satisfy what these uh, corporations want. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like a mixture between both. So now you have an Islamic law of yeah. uh, business and at the same time a capitalist law of business. Well, bo most of the time both don't mix. Mm -hmm. So you have to so you have to favor one over the other. And as we see, in, as the, rep the report has shown that mm -hmm. one of the empl employees has been promised to, to take a salary of $400, he only got $90. Yes. The rest of his salary that was gone was gone to the, to the sponsor or the kafil. Mm -hmm. Thus, this is kind of like a capitalist system, a modern the capitalist system of slavery yeah. at the same time for the employees. Mm -hmm. Um, do you think that there is an illegal implementation of kafala system at the beginning? Of or course. when the kafala system was written, we can say from the start, it did not take in consideration certain human regulations that can legally protect foreigners or expatriate workers. Um, is it illegally applied? Or at the beginning, the kafala system is illegal as a whole, uh, the system is not uh, lawful? I don't believe there are also any records of a true kafala system working as they were initially placed in, mm -hmm. in its bright in its bright title. I mean, kafala system has proved to be a modern day slavery system, okay. but at the same time, it does not organize much of uh, of markets, and so it only places the national on top of the migrant workers. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like uh, the the white people or the Jews. If, mm. if, it, if, it, if we could say so, the Jews of the GCCs. Yes. Okay, Mr. Um, Nicholas, of course here, um, um, is the government intending not to legally apply the kafala system or the kafala system does not, uh, it does not include certain laws that will give prof uh, protection for these employees or for even for the uh, expatriate workers? Yeah, well, you know, the Gulf states aren't the only states in the world which operate systems of sponsorship-based employment. You know, many Western states have, this, have the same systems, but to a far lesser extent. One of the, the main problems with, with the same, with the same, With the same uh, ideas and with the same rules? Uh, often, but, but it's not just about the law, it's about the implementation of the law. Yes. For example, you can have a sponsorship-based employment system um, whereby workers can't, can, can't change employers uh, in the UK, domestic workers, for example, that, that exists. The problem in the Gulf states is that when workers are abused <coughs> and when they go to uh, the Labour Ministry, if they're allowed to, if they're able to, then they're not able to change employers. Now, the law stipulates that they should be able to, but frequently the law is not enforced, not implemented, the, the oversight mechanisms don't function. So it's not simply about kafala, which, yes, is inherently exploitative and makes workers vulnerable to exploitation, mm -hmm. but it's also about the way in which workers are unable to uh, to exercise the rights that they do have under kafala, for example, to change employers when they're abused. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, here uh, is the labor law written in every constitution of GCC country um, matches uh, the rights given to migrant, migrant workers found in the kafala system because every, con every constitution in the GCC countries, of course, they've got a labor law. Um, does it match with the, with the rights that are given in the kafala system or was they taken in consideration while right the kafala system? Well, I, th I think what you would find is that the way it works in practice is that it discriminates against non-citizens, mm -hmm. I mean, irrespective of what 
constitution say, um, you know, in practice, what you have is a system that is directed solely at non-citizens uh, and hands control to citizens. Um, so, uh, I mean, it's very clearly discriminatory in effect against uh, migrant workers. Okay. Dear viewers, we will take a first break to take the episode and be right back. Stay tuned. Beyond the lines, beyond the surface, depth, clarity, substance. Beyond the discourse, beyond politics, beyond the shallowness of everyday politics. Welcome back, dear viewers. The Saudi labor law amended through Royal Decree No. M51 on September 27, 2005 excludes all domestic workers, denying them protections guaranteed to other workers, such as a day off once a week, limits on working hours and access to new labor courts to be established according to court system reforms announced in October 2007. Bahraini Labour Minister Majid Al Alawi said the changes to Kafala system means foreign workers would now be directly sponsored by the Labour Authority and would not rely on their employers. Qatar pledged to uphold international labour laws when it won hosting rights to the 2022 World Cup and it must, and it must keep this promise by abolishing its restrictive sponsorship system. Of course, Mr. Mohammed, yeah, you highlighted something about Qatar uh, trying as much as they can exactly. to keep the 2022 FIFA World Cup. Um, and, and, and is that keeping them in a critical condition nowadays? Exactly. Since uh, Qatar has been actually going after the, the hosting the FIFA World Cup mm -hmm. 2022, and at the same time, the kafala system or this modern-day slavery that they're working in for migrant yes. workers is not helping them. So FIFA and other international organizations, human rights organizations especially, have been going after Qatar to scratch off the, this, uh, this law in their uh, constitution, mm -hmm. as well as help make reforms. But yet they haven't shown any bright reforms um, to the kafala system so not far. Not at all. Mm -hmm. They have made m many promises and they, they just placed promises and nothing else then. There was no real constitutional work on this, nor legislative work. Okay. Uh, dear viewers, we're joined by Alex Malouf from Dubai and he's a journalist and an analyst. Hello and welcome uh, to Cases, Mr. Alex. Thank you. It's good to be with you. Mr. Alex, uh, from your perspective as a journalist and, of course, observing what's happening and, and the results of the implication of kafala system, what kind of violation are these expatriate workers subjected to due to the kafala there's system? Three to, there's three things to bear in mind. One is the system itself. Mm -hmm. uh, two is the implementation of the system. And three is oversight of the system. Um, it very much depends on who you're working with and their own regulations internally inside companies. Uh, if you're working with a multinational base in the Gulf, you can expect to be treated as you would in any other parts of the world. Mm -hmm. If you're working with, uh, with others who have the same respect for human rights, then the situation can be different, uh, especially in, in parts of the Gulf whereby the Gafi is responsible for uh, entry and exit of the country, uh, of the person's rights, person's ability to travel even internally within the country. Mm -hmm. Of course, here, uh, most of the times the passports are taken away from these uh, migrated workers. Is that what makes their position weaker, uh, Mr. Alex, because they do not have certain documents that can prove their position or their opinion or whether they are harassed by this company that they are working for, whether private or governmental? Um, 
Again, the, the laws are, and this is the Gulf of fairly clear in terms of the workers' rights, it's, it's really to do with the implementation. Mm -hmm. um, we often see workers having uh, their cases redressed, but maybe to the small percentage of actual uh, labor issues in the Gulf itself. If you look at some of the reforms which are taking place within the Gulf, for example, in Saudi Arabia with the uh, NITAC system, uh, more more power really is being given to the workers in terms of their ability to move companies if they would like to. Uh, for example, a worker can move from a company which is in the red status to a company which is in the green status, um, and their employer cannot uh, object to that to move. So there are changes afoot. There are, I think, uh, many people in the Gulf, uh, nationally included, who would see reform as necessary, but uh, the wheels of a government that often turn slowly. Okay, uh, Mr. Alex, have you registered or even observed uh, certain violations uh, practiced upon these expatriate workers, especially in Saudi Arabia, by their employees, by their employers, of course? Have you registered certain kind of harassment, certain kind of violence? Because I've already read something about or even documents that said that there are certain um, uh, expatriate workers in jail and even no one knows about them and even they are illegally jailed at one point or another. Have you registered something like that in Saudi Arabia? There, there, are, there are cases in, in every country where workers' rights have been um, taken, have been abused by their employers. Um, I've, I've seen it with myself with colleagues who I've known, colleagues who have not been able to travel, um, colleagues who have fallen out with their kafil, with their sponsor. Um, with, with many cases, though, I think, again, it's, it's an issue of awareness. Um, Unfortunately, many employees are not really aware of their rights, even in, in countries like Saudi. Um, there is uh, a process whereby they can actually go to the Ministry of Labor, to the Labor Office, and actually register a complaint. And often, I think, uh, to give them that, many governments or many uh, government authorities actually do take action. Um, it, but it's often the case that the, um, the, the worst abuses are reported upon. Okay. Um, and Mr. Of course, Ian Nicholas, uh, speaking to you, joining us from London, um, I would like to know if you, would, if you would evaluate the way that human rights organizations around the world are actually dealing with the subject of kafala system or even trying as much as they can to resolve, uh, the, to resolve the differences or even the, the, the illegal points that are found in the kafala system. Are they doing a good job up till this moment? Have you seen like, some kind of sufficient steps taken? I know that Human Rights Watch released a 71-paper document, but is that enough in your opinion? Well, I think the, the rights groups, it's not just Human Rights Watch, Amnesty, the International Trade Union Movement uh, are involved in these campaigns. I think, um, I think they are now giving it the attention it deserves. It's a very, very serious problem. Um, what we are encountering is, is great stubbornness on the part of the Gulf governments to reform their systems. Lack of uh, collaboration and cooperation between... Organ uh, these organizations uh, and the GCC? Well, it's very difficult to talk to these governments. They have, um, you know, the citizens there are very loath to give up the system. It provides um, great, um, you know, security over them. It enables them to earn a living. Many of them own companies. So they don't really want to reform Kafala. And another huge problem, I think, is that the, the Gulf government's Western allies um, are not particularly keen on issuing any sort of criticism of the Gulf states for, for maintaining this. Yeah, that's exactly what I wanted to ask. It's kind of astonishing when Western allies, of course, to the GCC, uh, who do care about democracy a lot and, and speak about, and there are a lot of speeches that highlight democracy and how it should be practiced in some Middle Eastern countries nowadays. Mm -hmm. It's kind of astonishing when we've seen that they lack any kind, or they do not practice certain kind of pressure on the GCC countries to abolish this inhumane law, which is named Kafala system. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. That's a perfect summary of the problem. Um, Western governments aren't particularly keen to, uh, to lobby for the rights of, of poor, vulnerable South Asian workers. Now, at the same time, another important aspect of this is that neither are the Indian government or the Sri Lankan government yes, or the Bangladeshi yeah. government. Now, these are governments which, uh, which should be lobbying for the rights of their citizens to be upheld. Exactly. They don't because this is a big business uh, and a lot of people make a lot of money out of this. Uh, okay, this what's system. the reason here? Mutual interest between countries and this expatriate worker is taking, paying the price? Well, you've got a lot of very rich countries next to a lot of very poor countries and those poor countries are competing for business. 
Um, it's very profitable to, to have you know a few hundred thousand of your workers go to the Gulf. You, you secure you know millions of dollars in remissions, mm -hmm. uh, and you get a massive number of, of workers you know off your hands, as it were. So there's a bit of a race to the bottom going on, unfortunately, um, in that uh, in that respect. And the, the the South Asian states don't don't work together as they should to to bargain for you know for better conditions across the board for all migrant workers. That's a it's another crucial aspect of, of this of problem. Of course, when there isn't a sufficient pressure, then therefore nothing would change. Um, and Mr. Alex, of course, here a question goes to you. A widespread phenomenon is now seen in GCC, which is called visa trading. And it's actually called a million, uh, multi-million dollar industry, where the same visa is sold twice or even three times to, the, to different persons, different um, expatriate workers. Um, of course, here we haven't heard, and please correct me if I'm right, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, that we haven't heard of official or even formal prosecution by GCC countries to this fact, to the visa trading, to the fact of this phenomenon being practiced by uh, some uh, masters of economic economy inside GCC. The, the visa trading issue has been, uh, is a long-standing issue, um, long-standing problem, particularly in Saudi Arabia, which is the biggest market for expatriate workers in the Gulf. Um, it is, it is very well known. Um, the, the government is taking steps to change this and abolish the system of visa trading. That's why at the moment they're registering um, or re-registering all of the, uh, the expatriate workers at the moment in the kingdom. So they are um, aware of this multi-million dollar industry they're, that is taking... They're aware even there have been, there have been uh, pieces, opinion pieces in al Riyadh newspaper and other Arab newspapers which are all government controlled and owned. Uh, as well in Saudi Arabia, actually calling for its, uh, its reform um, or its abolishment in terms of uh, stopping people buying, selling visas, nationals to sell onto foreigners. Mm -hmm. And I'd actually say that, again, both parties are responsible because... Okay, obviously then what kind of restrictive... Allow me, Mr. Alex. Well. What kind of restrictive laws or restrictive campaigns uh, is the GCC, the GCC practicing uh, to, uh, to demo, at least to minimize uh, or even to control the spread of visa trading, because everyone in Saudi Arabia now is working with mm -hmm. that. With the new system uh, under Nitakat, Nit um, mm -hmm. you have to work with the company you are employed by. Yes. So you cannot work uh, for another person or another company. You mm -hmm. have to work with that person. If you are caught in the company of court, uh, there, are, there are consequences for both parties. Okay, now agents in GCC are also offering the free uh, visa to migrant workers and uh, many say that there is no secured employment with such visa. Uh, what's the information that you have upon the free visa also? Mr. Alex? Sorry, can you just repeat that? Yes, um, agents in GCC uh, are also offering free visa, despite of working visa, uh, to migrant workers, and many are saying that it's not a secured visa. Do you have enough information about the subject and how is it used? Well, in, in most markets, you cannot come into the, the country without having a working visa already lined up beforehand. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so there is nothing called free there, visa there here? And there is nothing, you know, in, in places and countries like Saudi, you have uh, Omra visas for religious tourism, you have visit visas for other markets in the GCC, um, but particularly for, for certain countries uh, such as the Asian subcontinent, you have to have your visa pre-arranged and also deposits given. So they, they're, they're very firm in terms of having people um, now coming in. Uh, if you're coming in for work, you have your work visa beforehand, before you arrive. Uh, if you're coming for tourism or anything else, again, you have a separate type of visa. And again, we're, we're seeing at the moment uh, uh, campaigns going on to, to encourage uh, illegal immigrants to, to leave certain parts of the Gulf. Okay, and Mr. So Alex, far, from Saudi Arabia, I think 200,000 have left this year. Okay, Mr. Alex, from your perspective as a journalist as, and as an analyst, what is needed on the ground in order to like, at least reform the kafala system if there is one place or another a chance for it to be reformed or at least abolish the kafala system? What are the legal steps that can be taken on the ground at least to give some benefit to these expatriate workers? I, I think Bahrain was very bold in terms yes. of the steps it took some years back in terms of scrapping the system mm. and having everybody uh, under the, the Ministry of Labour. That was a very bold step. Um, and I, I foresee other countries in the region solely following this step. Uh, Kuwait is, is already in the process of doing that. I would also foresee Qatar as well doing that shortly after uh, 
uh, after the uh, accession of the new Emir. And I see other countries following suit. I think that will become the norm uh, across the GCC. But again, in, in this region, government does operate very slowly. There is awareness on both sides, on the side of nationals and also foreigners, of many issues, of all of the issues, uh, the serious issues, and there's issues which are not as serious, not as immediate, but uh, harm is definitely coming. However, a lot actually argue whether it's a camera flag or that even Bahrain actually abolished uh, the kafala system. Do you think that they're working on the right path here? I, I think in, in terms of the, the idea and in terms of the aims, it gives more rights to the employee. Okay. Um, it takes the control In from comparison the to other GCC countries, you're saying? In, in so far as other countries, you know, we've seen Kuwait move in that direction. Um, and I think, again, with the pressure in terms of the World Cup and also yes, other, other Qatar. pressure coming from, from the outside, I think other, other markets will move that way. Saudi is slightly different. Saudi has internal pressures related to unemployment among the Saudi youth. Um, even in Saudi, again, there is, uh, there is a push for reforming of the Kafala mm -hmm. system because it is not sustainable long term. It okay. has been abused for far too long. Mr. Alex Malouf, a journalist and an analyst, thank you for joining us from Dubai. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Mohammed, um, obviously there are several points that are being uh, mm. highlighted and I would like to discuss them with you. Of course, Mr. Nicholas said that um, we lack a kind of sign of Western pressure, even allies uh, of GCC being pressure, pressuring uh, the, the country uh, to abolish a kafala system. And that's one of the reasons why they are moving on with what they are doing. How would you like to comment it's on that? It's mostly on the dependency of Western countries on uh, Gulf oil mm -hmm. or mostly... Uh, or the multinational companies that are yes. opening Gulf, that are actually uh, multi-million multi -million dollar companies for Western countries. So that, I mean, economy has a big pressure on Western countries. And there was a theory that was actually launched long ago that if Saudi Arabia alone cuts oil from the U.S., the, uh, the price of the Cadillac car would go down from thousands of dollars to about $500. Mm -hmm. So that's the power of the oil. Uh, on and the pressure of it on Western countries it's because as of well. Because these countries are actually benefiting exactly. and they're having interest, especially it's in Bahrain. It's That's never about democracy. Problem. It was never about so never spreading about democracy. And we can mm. see a, a big example of that in Iraq. Yes. There was the whole idea of the, uh, the destructive weapons mm. of uh, Saddam Hussein. It was all about the oil, the oil companies that the Bush family owned. Mm -hmm. So it was never about... De spreading democracy, or so how would you spread democracy by, pr by placing war? Yes. It's kind of, there's a fallacy in that notion. Okay. Um, of course, Mr. Nicola, according uh, to labor law of GCC countries, migrant uh, workers are banned from forming associations, trade unions, or even joining in demonstrations or even strikes. Do you think that that's actually stopping them from expressing their own opinion because these are more obstacles placed in their way? Yes, it's another factor uh, in the problem. I mean, only uh, a few weeks ago, 500 workers were deported from Dubai yes. for, for joining in a strike. So, so certainly, when workers see um, see the consequences of them, you know, taking what is a you know an internationally established right, the right mm -hmm. to strike, the right to collectively bargain for better pay and conditions, then um, then obviously they're very wary of doing that. It's another factor in this very a uh, complex system that, that keeps them vulnerable and keeps them, keeps them you know, oppressed and, and susceptible to abuse. And so even the labor law within the GCC countries and the constitution of the GCC countries does not even give rights to, to, to these expatriate workers under the kafala system? Well, that's not, I mean, the kafala system is like an immigration law. Uh, the labor law is, is another aspect of the problem. The problem with the labor it law... It cannot be implemented on the expatriate workers? It cannot be? Yes, correct. The problem is not that the labour laws aren't good. If you look at them, they're actually not bad at all. Yes. The problem with the sure. labour laws is they're not implemented, and when workers complain, when they go to ministries of labour uh, and say that you know they've been abused or they haven't been paid their wages... Then according to what law do they judge them here, Mr. Uh, Nicholas? Well, I mean, all the GCC states say that you should pay your workers on time. That's, mm. that's, not, that's, not, a, that's not an issue. The issue is when they're not paid on time, uh, that the institutions which are there to protect their rights on paper, don't do that.
Okay, despite the fact that even laborers can be subjected to deportation, as you highlighted, or even prosecution, if they join these strikes that are exactly. uh, legalized to, to normal, to nationals. Even uh, dear viewers, we'll take a final break and be right back. The crisis of capitalism, the European impasse, the energy shortages, the emerging power of Asia, the economic power of the Arab world, the economic debate, informative, revealing, and progressive. It discusses the economic event of the world. Economic debate, where the numbers reveal the truth. Dear viewers, welcome back. Sir Mohammed, per the law of most GCC countries, migrants can change their abusive employer three times, and I read that. Um, and the embassy and embassy, uh, the embassy, of course, can help in that respect. Is mm. that true, or is that implemented, or is it only pen to paper? Not at all, actually, because there, if you have several law, labor laws, and that is the only right that I found, actually, to the expatriate exactly. workers that they do have the right. Uh, out of all the things that we read, of course, that they, they, oh, they have the right to change their employer up to three times if they got an abusive employer. So have you heard something about that? Actually, I, there are no, I don't think there are any records of that happening because if you don't have the right to strike or even in, in a general way express your opinion for mm -hmm. your employer, then yes. how would you go to an embassy and actually complain about what your employer is doing if you can't even complain to the state or the Ministry of Labor for mm -hmm. that? Because there is more than one law there are more than one law that actually contradict with each other and they're taking the one that's actually in the advantage of the nationals or the employer okay of course now we're joined by Mohammed al maskati president of the bahrain youth society for human rights joining us from manama hello and welcome mr Mohammed, and hello and welcome to cases Hello, hi, thank you very much for this uh, opportunity. You're welcome. Uh, Mr. Mohammed, Bahrain and Kuwait several times uh, promised to abolish the kafala system, and especially in year 2009. However, they both failed in implementing uh, that. Why, in your opinion, what's the, what are the obstacles that banned them from even implementing this law or abolishing actually, the kafala system? Actually, uh, the government uh, in Bahrain uh, uh, trying to implement uh, the, the law, but we are facing a situation. Uh, there is a, a, what you call the big businesses here in Bahrain who are related to the royal family. Yes. Uh, uh, they are uh, uh, beyond the law. They are not re respect the law. They are uh, trying to uh, uh, close, uh, the stop this kind of laws because they will uh, losing a lot of money and the, the businesses they affected, and and the, the police and the Ministry of Labor didn't take any uh, uh, action uh, on that. In the same time, uh, the is it because the government is benefiting from the kafala system, Mr. Mohammed? Because, yeah, of course, the kafala, kafala system, system is, 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 uh, is cheap totally laborers. They're, they are hiring cheap laborers uh, through the kafala system, and that is beneficial to the government in one place or another. Yeah, the, the, the government is uh, trying to, uh, uh, to, to implement this kind of law to stop the kafala system. But until today, there is a lot of cases uh, uh, on the kafala system happening uh, in the police stations. At the same time, the migrant workers in Bahrain, they don't know about the Bahraini laws. Yes. So they cannot demand the laws. They don't know, uh, they, don't, they don't speak Arabic. Uh, uh, some of them, they don't speak okay, also but, but, English. But in so this case also they, we are, is... We are facing but Mr. Mohammed, in these cases also to blame is the government because when a law is implemented, they are supposed to launch campaigns in order to raise awareness among the nationals and the foreigners uh, that there is a new law and, that's, and it can be followed at one place or another because you're saying that most of them do not speak Arabic. So therefore, isn't it on the shoulder of the government to raise awareness in that aspect? I think the government is using the law as a propaganda uh, yeah. to change their image. Uh, 
uh, and then to internationally, especially uh, uh, canceling the kafala system is is demanded by the United States and the free trade between Bahrain and the United States. Mm -hmm. And that's why the government's uh, uh, putting more pressuring on the kafala system. I don't think so to, to, to implementing this law or to changing the behavior of the business owners, but to uh, uh, changing and using that as a propaganda uh, and, and internationally uh, and uh, with the United States uh, regarding the free trade. Okay, but do you believe that the U.S. and the allies of the GCC countries are placing a um, adequate amount of pressure on these governments to actually abolish the kafala system? Yeah, I think I think the United States is putting more pressure on on GCC, uh, especially on Bahrain, because the free free trade uh, regarding the kafala system, and that was it's very clear that until today, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the government not putting more pressuring on on translating or launching campaign to the migrant worker and telling them what their rights, what their uh, 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 duties, and uh, translate the, the kafala system or translate the laws to a uh, different language that is understood by the uh, migrant workers. Some of the migrant workers, they don't know what is the law here in Bahrain, and there is no uh, effort from the Ministry of Labor to help them to understand okay. the laws. Mr. Mohammed, as the president of the Bahrain Youth Society for Human Rights, War, uh, Human Rights sorry, do you believe that, that you do have an, also a duty in order to raise awareness to these migrant workers about the importance of the laws that is being implemented in Bahrain that gives them certain rights when it comes to the kafala system? We're trying to uh, to uh, translate some of the laws uh, related to the to uh, migrant workers. Yes. We're trying to uh, uh, contact the migrant worker to tell them what kind of the laws, what's their rights, okay. uh, what the embassies must doing. And some of the embassies, that's the most of the problem. Some of the embassies in Bahrain, they are not uh, having, uh, they are not pressuring on the government to to protect. Uh, uh, their citizen, uh, only one embassy is that the Philippines embassies who are putting more pressure and pressure on the government to help their citizens. So okay, Mr. Muhammad, and the people to, are responding? To ask the embassies to put their, their pressure, yes. their efforts to help their citizens, especially uh, Indian embassies and other uh, Asian uh, embassies. Okay, Mr. Mohammed, what's the response uh, from uh, these people that are actually are ra raising awareness to how, how are they responding? Are they being thankful because you are actually your, 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 your organization is raising awareness at one point or another? Actually, uh, we, we, we we get bad uh, effect, uh, bad impact from the uh, bad response from the embassies and the embassies saying that yes. they are uh, doing what they can do, but uh, some of the some of the uh, migrant worker they don't contact their embassies for more information when they arrive the country, and we are trying to to tell the embassies to contact each person yes. who are uh, arriving the country, trying to help them to give him more information about mm -hmm. the laws in the country, more information about how they can be uh, transferred from, from, uh, from one work to another work, and all this information is important to, to the migrant workers. Yes. Uh, and basically, they don't also give effort to do this, some of them because uh, lack of employees, some of them because they don't care to, to put uh, pressuring on the government, and they think that if they put pressuring on the government, that will affect the migrant worker uh, in Bahrain. Okay, so of course, as you highlighted, the embassy also is responsible. Um, Mr. Nicholas, um, does the Human Rights Watch contain documents of, of the number of migrant workers jailed after uh, their employers made false accusations against them? Uh, um, it's extremely difficult just to get an accurate sense of how many migrant workers are in the Gulf states, uh, never mind how many are in prison. Um, we we do receive cases of, or we do receive uh, notice of cases of workers who have gone to jail and kafala, uh, but we don't really have a, an accurate sense of, of how many are in jail because of the system. Um, too many would be the, the short answer. Mm -hmm. 
Mohammed, of course, uh, Al Maskati, the president of the Bahrain Youth Society of Human Rights, joining us from Manama. He highlighted uh, that they are launching campaigns and raising awareness of some of the reforms that are made by the Bahrain government when it comes to the kafala system. How important are these steps, of course, in collaboration with the embassies found inside Bahrain? How important are these steps, in your opinion? Mr. Nicola? Uh, sorry, how important are what steps? Yes, I am saying that Mr. Mohammed Al Maskati highlighted that there are certain campaigns that he is doing or the organization is taking in order to like show the poor people, show the foreigners, show these expatriate workers that there are certain laws that they can go back to where it can protect them. How important are these steps in your opinion? As long as the US are not so, or even the allies of the GCC are not, do not have the will to actually keep certain pressure on the yeah, GCC countries. The work, of, the work of groups like Mohammed's uh, are incredibly important in, in informing workers as to the rights that they do have. But the, the problem is the system, the problem is the government, the problem is the regulation and the enforcement. So at the end of the day, no matter how much you inform workers about their rights, unless the system is changed, unless the, the bad laws are abolished, unless the good laws are enforced, and unless some people go to jail, unfortunately, for, for their exploitation, of migrant workers, then this system will go on. Uh, informing workers of their rights is excellent, it's important, but it, it won't solve the problem. Uh, the problem is the, the government, uh, and uh, it's, it's to, to them that we must address uh, our, our efforts. Okay, in the future, are there certain plans to issue reports and documents that speaks in depth about the status of these expatriate workers, the sufferings that they face in the GCC countries? Does the HRW have the will to actually issue official and formal documents that can shed the light on the living condition, the deteriorating uh, living condition of these expatriate workers in the GCC countries? And by that, of course, grab the attention of the world to them, probably in one way or another, keep certain pressure on the GCC. Yes, I mean, Human Rights Watch was one of the first organizations to draw attention to this issue back in 2006 in Dubai. Yes. Uh, and since then, the organization has regularly uh, issued reports uh, on, on various migrant worker issues across the region. Uh, that, that, that will continue. It's a priority issue for the organization, and we're glad to, to see that other organizations are, are joining our efforts, uh, both internationally and domestically, uh, mm -hmm. like Mohammed's organization. So this, this will remain a priority issue and we'll keep pushing for the reforms that we believe are essential and also reforms that we think are uh, practical yes. uh, and can be implemented because these are very wealthy countries. They don't need this system. Okay. Um, Mr. Mohammed, uh, of course, uh, Mr. Mohammed Al Muscati, how important is the ILO, uh, the International Labour Organization Conventions, and how important is it to be ratified and applied in your opinion? Actually, uh, uh, international organization is playing a good role in, in, in Bahrain. Uh, yes. Not only uh, the international labor organization, but mm. also uh, all, all reports coming from Human Rights Watch, especially uh, it's, it's affect the decisions of a maker in, in Bahrain. But I, I, as Nick said, that the problem is not with, uh, with, uh, with the laws here. The problem with how we can uh, put more pressure on changing the behavior of, of, the, of the people here, the behavior of uh, business owners. Uh, that's the most um, important. The international uh, community is playing a good role. It's having more pressuring on the situation, but it's, it's, a, it's most important how to change behavior uh, mm -hmm. uh, in, in the country, and not only in Bahrain. I, I, I mentioning the GCC uh, countries, uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, Dubai, and other other countries. It's, it's important to see implement, implementing the law regarding also changing behavior. International community can only pressuring uh, the states. They cannot uh, having sanction on the state on, uh, on, uh, on the migrant worker. And that's why it's very important to say changing also coming from inside, it will help 
to uh, respect the human rights uh, uh, in, in this, in this uh, uh, matter. Yes, and of course, uh, and there is a more uh, task here actually to be handled, which is, of course, by shedding the light on how devastating the kafala system is. Therefore, of course, you're raising awareness, and your organization can play an important role in that, uh, Mr. Muhammad. A final question goes to you, Mr. Muhammad de Klait. Uh, do you think that one of the main reasons why the GCC countries are not abolishing kafala system is because their government is not providing an alternative uh, that can actually suit them and suit their economy? I don't believe actually the GCC governments want to place an alternative. In the end, that these these people, the kafils, mm -hmm. are actually uh, business owners, they're owners of corporations, or they're, they're like uh, agents for multinational companies. Yeah. So they're mostly the funders, and they're actually the, the pressure on the government in order to implement laws on migrant workers or other nationals. Mm -hmm. So at the same time, uh, governments would not allow any law yeah. to, to actually... Uh, stand in the way of these corporate corporations. Yes, and of course here, um, to what extent do you believe that GCC countries are violating Article 13 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights here? That because even GCC countries ratified that? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay, Mr. Muhammad uh, Clyde, social and human rights activist, thank you for being with us You're in welcome. the studio here, joining us from Beirut. And we do have Nicholas McGean, UAE researcher at Human Rights Watch, joining us from London. Thank you very much uh, for joining us in cases. And Muhammad Al Maskati, joining us from Manama, who is the president of the Bahrain Youth for Human Rights. Dear viewers, that's all the time that we have. And whenever those are persecuted, that place we tackle case by case. Thank you for watching.